Elder, revered by the ancients and still used today for colds, flus, allergies, and more. Conrad Richter tells you why elderberries and flowers are powerful medicines and how you can use elder for your family's health and healing. Welcome to Richter's Seminars. This video presentation is from a series of free educational seminars on herb and garden topics offered each year at Richter's. Okay, so this second part, we're going to be talking about the uses of uh, elder, and, um, and it's going to be this part is going to be broken into a further two parts. I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes, I maybe a half an hour, on the medicinal side, some of the medicinal uses and research that uh, we know about uh, elderberry, and Koidu, Koidu Sulev who has been with Richter's for many, many years, uh, will speak about some of the other uses of, uh, of uh, elderberry, uh, jams, jellies, and a little bit on her personal experiences in using elderberry for medicinal uses. So um, let's uh, move right on. Um, you know, uh, the thing about uh, elder, which is part of why herbs, uh, herb, the Herb of the Year program is so great, is that um, uh, it, it gives you a chance to, to, you know, dig into the subject a little bit, learn a little bit, and uh, about some of the history of of the plants, and it gives you a little bit from that history, you get a little bit more appreciation for the value of a plant. I'm a firm believer that. Traditional knowledge gained over many years of trial and error is very, very valuable information. Some of it is coached in language that modern science and modern medicine, you know, ridicules to a certain degree. But if you can get past the funny language, the old style languages, things like blood purifier, which doesn't have a modern uh, equivalent, um, if you can get past that, and you start analyzing some of the old knowledge, you find an incredible wealth of knowledge. The best part about it has been tried and true for years, oftentimes thousands of years, unlike some of the modern drugs that have only been subjected to a few, you know, controlled studies in a lab or in a clinic. So I'm a, I have a great appreciation for the old knowledge, and I, but I like to apply scientific knowledge to try to understand the old knowledge. And when you can bring the two together and make sense out of it, then uh, the confidence in that herb just skyrockets. So what did some of the old guys say? Well, they said, this guy here, Hippocrates, before the time of Christ uh, in Greece, said it is a medicine chest. And he meant it in a Fullest me meaning, to the fullest meaning of that, that term. It can do so many different things. And even his later compatriot, uh, Dioscorides, uh, he too called it one of the greatest medicinal herbs. I, all these years, more than 40 years of being in the herb business, I never really thought of elder as a medicinal plant. But these guys have been saying that for, for more than 2,000 years. And a little later on, the, the Roman, famous Roman uh, physician Galen of Pergamon, he too said the same thing. It's such a fantastic herb. Everyone must have it in their, their uh, medica, uh, Materia Medica. Flash, uh, fast forward to the 1600s, and a German uh, physician by the name of uh, Martin Blockwich, uh, he put together in Latin, he wrote a complete treatise on, on elder, uh, covering everything from the types to the constituents, uh, as they understood in those, in those days, uh, to the, to the uh, afflictions that it helps, and the ways that you use it. And uh, more recently, when this uh, particular manuscript was discovered just a few years ago, uh, it was republished uh, in, in a modern version, The Anatomy of the Elder. Um, in this uh, 
in this book, I'm just going to, I know the people in the back probably can't read this, so I'll just read, read out some of it. But he has chapters on every major uh, affliction or ailment that that elder is known to be useful for. Everything from melancholy and epilepsy to bar, toothache, eye problems, uh, skin problems, uh, mouth and throat, on and on. I'm just skipping through many of these things. Cough and hoarseness, fainting, fevers, particular fevers. Come back to that in a little, a little while. Little while. Smallpox and measles, and it goes on and on. Altogether, 30 chapters, 30 different major uh, ailments that was it was regarded to be effective for. Indeed, right up to the time of the modern antibiotics, elder was one of the chief antibiotic type herbs. When you had a problem with uh, infections, particularly uh, cold, you know, uh, pneumonia and similar types, of, uh, you know, bacterial type infections, uh, elder was the first choice. And in many different forms, whether it be a wine, whether it be a, a syrup, or whether it be a tea. And in that same book, Martin uh, Blockwich, uh, he talks about the different parts of the plants that can be used. So he talks about the berries and the flowers. I talked about the berries and the flowers previously. That's where most of the modern use, uh, those are the parts of the plants that, that are used in, in modern use of uh, elder. But also the buds, the leaves, the bark, the roots, even the pith, that pith that I talked about that's, that's in the center of the, of the hollow stems. Uh, and even the fungus that grows on a certain fungi, fungi that grow on the elder is useful for medicinal purpose, purposes. So the modern uses tend to uh, focus on things like colds, influenza, herpes, allergies, catarrh, cough, immune weakness. And if you, uh, one, one local herbalist uh, in Toronto calls it a star performer. It's one of her favorite herbs to use in common, for common use, uh, household use. Um, <clears throat> but if you look at this list, so many of them are connected with, with contagions. Uh, with uh, pathogens such as uh, uh, viruses and uh, bacteria. So microorganisms. So this got me interested. I, I was, uh, you know, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm very much open to, to the knowledge of traditional knowledge. And I feel that to modern herbalists that is building on, on the traditions of the old time is uh, very much influenced by the knowledge gained over the hundreds and thousands of years. So for them to put all these together and rely on these today, even today, in the treatment of, of, uh, of people uh, in, in modern herbal practice, uh, and showing that there is a connection with the viruses in particular, that got me interested. That got, piqued my interest. I wanted to dig in a little bit further and see what that was all about. Is there any scientific evidence to support that modern use, or those modern uses? Well, thinking about flu in particular, influenza, but just uh, if I can bear with me, I'm going to show a few little kind of more academic y kind of slides, but I'll be take care to explain them to as much as I can. So this happens to be a schematic of, of what it, the influenza virus looks like. In the middle is the payload. It's the virus, that, it, it's the DNA or the RNA, the genetic material that the virus wants to inject into your cells because it wants to hijack your cells, use your cellular machinery to make more of itself and to propagate itself. So its task is to find a way to take over your cells. So what does it do? It has to have a way to adhere to your cell. So it's completely covered in this envelope here with, pro with, uh, with proteins that bind, that attach themselves to, uh, to the cell membrane. 
At the same time, it's got to have proteins in there, enzyme-like proteins, that can dissolve and open up and break open the cell membrane and allow the payload to be injected in. And so all that's on the coating of the influenza. It's an incredible uh, art uh, piece of uh, warfare here going on. Um, and here's another shot. Unfortunately, I'm sure mo many of you cannot see this very well. But uh, same idea, but showing now the membrane here. And on the membrane are these what they call receptors. It so happens that the respiratory tract, the nasal passages, the throat, the lungs, all have a certain kind of uh, receptors uh, and, and uh, these, these appendages sticking out away from the cell. This serves a number of different purposes, one of which is to keep the membranes moist, keeps water uh, close to the membrane, um, but uh, also is a, plays a role in the movement of, of the immune system components in and out of cells. So the, the flu virus hijacks that system, and the Binding proteins bind onto this thing, and these things chew them up, and then they chew up these proteins and create the opening. And so, before long, the virus injects its genetic material, and it's now producing all sorts of uh, copies of itself. So, why am I telling you all this? Because it's linked. Uh, it, it turns out that. Elder, unlike every other herb that I've ever uh, researched, attacks this process directly. When you think of all the other, uh, many other herbs that have been uh, recommended for flus and colds, generally their effect is on boosting the immune system. It so happens that elder does that too, but we'll talk about that in a moment. But what it does principally is shut down this process. If you heard of a drug out there, the, anti the flu drug called Tamiflu for one, there are others as well, the Tamiflu attacks uh, this particular protein and that protein only, okay? But it's very effective for now. The problem with the, 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 the viral drugs is that we're already seeing resistance, that the, the flu is already counteracting these drugs and finding ways around them. A whole class of anti, uh, flu drugs have been completely disabled already, and we've got just this one group left. The Tamiflu is one of them. The thing about elder, as you will see in, a, you know, in the following slides, is that it works on many levels. And it's very difficult for the flu viruses to develop a resistance. Most of the research that I encountered involved two different commercial products, both of them European. One of them is Sambucol. It's an, uh, it's an extract of uh, the berries, and added to it is a little bit of echinacea and a little bit of uh, propolis. And there are other formulations as well. But principally, the main ingredient is the elderberry extract. And this is the other product, the main product that's been under a lot of clinical research. Rubini, also European, but this one is just elderberry. So the research I'm going to re relate to you is using either of these two products. Okay, I know you've... For some of you, you haven't been to school for a few years, and uh, you know this is a little hard to digest. So I'm going to go through it. It's uh, actually quite simple once uh, you take the time to go through and understanding what this is. What this is is um, a chart that shows patient what patients' responses were as the ten days progressed after uh, the onset of flu. So when, on the first day when they started experiencing the, the symptoms of flu, they started taking the treatment, in this case, Sambuco, the first product that I mentioned. And they compare, in the study, they compared the people who were taking the Sambuco with those who were taking uh, a placebo. 
and it was fully randomized, it was fully uh, blind, and uh, so it's quite a good quality study. But what this says is that the higher the, the bars, the higher these black bars, the better the, peop the patients felt. The ones, the black ones, are the ones that received the elderberry extract. The white ones are the ones that received the placebo, nothing. So as you see, the days progressed. From the, already on the second day, those taking elderberry already experienced some benefit. It felt better already. By the third day, they're up to about 70% better if you average it out. By the fourth day, they were almost completely recovered. Meanwhile, those that did not get anything, it took them until the eighth day before they were back to normal. This type of study has been repeated a number of times. I have a lot of confidence that elderberry does exactly that. It does have an effect on the flu. The flu uh, was verified in the, uh, in the, um, the, they took whatever tests they needed to do to find the flu in the patients, so they verified the flu was present. So uh, this is a pretty strong evidence of the effect of, 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 of elderberry. Now, you, most of you will not be able to see this slide. Unfortunately, I did not have a good image to share with you. But this is from another study. And these are two different virus, uh, flu viruses that are, you know, scientists have a whole store of all the different viruses that have been isolated. They keep them for a scientific reason. When, when they want looking for new ways to, uh, to control uh, uh, flu, um, they have these stored in freezers and make them available to researchers. So what we have here is that two different viruses and in the first column here, oh, these are by the way, these are petri dishes. These are just flat dishes with fluid in there, the culture medium in there, and then they would put uh, whatever uh, treatment was going to be put in there. In the first column, they put, there's no virus, and no extract. It's what's called a control. So you just, there's nothing to be seen here. Okay? In the second row here, they have only virus. No extract, no, no uh, elderberry extract. And you get, you can't see it, but it's much better, much better, and you see the paper, uh, uh, the original paper. You see, in both of these here, you see the, the virus growing. Okay? In the final one here, now you're at the same virus, but now you're adding the, echinase, uh, the, um, the elder, and in this first type of uh, flu virus, almost completely gone. Not completely, but almost completely gone. In this other virus, uh, flu virus, um, it's, it's still present, but it's changed, and there's something happening, and it, it's um, leading the researchers to believe that there is a, a therapeutic effect in what is going on there. Still very early in our understanding. Now, one of the things about flu is that usually the flu, even if you do nothing, as I indicated on that one slide, you will recover. Your body has the defense mechanism to recover. It's just a pain. You lose weight. Sometimes you want to lose weight, but uh, um, but uh, it, it really is hard on the body. But for those few individuals who are weak to begin with, there's a big risk of getting a secondary infection from bacteria, usually pneumonia. And that pneumonia is actually the more dangerous thing. It kills in a lot of cases. So. Current, uh, um, so the, the, ch the problem is, is that, that if you treat for, for the virus, you, may, you also need to treat for the bacteria if it takes hold. But elder also goes after the bacteria at the same time. So what we have here are different concentrations of the elderberry extract 
And here we have levels of bacteria, four different types of bacteria, streptococcus types and another one it causes catarrh. And as the concentration increases, well here you see no, no elderberry at all. And then as the concentration increases, the bacterial load is down, goes down. So what an ingredient here. You've got something that attacks the virus directly, and if it somehow allows, if the bacteria somehow gets, takes hold in your body, it's going after the bacteria as well. Wow. Tell me a drug out there that can do that. In fact, most of the time, and as you know, there's a lot of uh, abusive antibiotics being prescribed for people who have common cold, and it does absolutely nothing because the virus, uh, the, the flu and the colds are viral infections. Antibiotics do nothing against the viruses. They can only kill down some of the uh, secondary infections. So that's why we've got such a serious problem with antibiotic resistance development because of the indiscriminate use of these antibiotics. How much better would it be to be using something like elder? Would garlic be a good pairing if you just used it in foods or eating it raw? Absolutely. There's lots of studies that suggest garlic will... The question is, would garlic be a good thing to be including in your food if you're worried about things like this? Yes, of course. There are lots of studies that suggest that garlic has a very big beneficial effect on flu and uh, the common cold. But it's none of them, and as I'll show on another table, many of the herbs do not have the same direct effect that elder has. Actually, here's the table I want to refer to. So here is a, these are, this table here is reporting results from a diverse number of else, different studies. You can't compare one to another. Okay, so when one studied echinacea, it's not directly comparable to a second study on elderberry because they use different people, different populations, different methods, different, you know, all sorts of different things. But still, this gives you a, an interesting summary of what we know about what herbs do for the uh, colds and flus. So here's, this column here is placebo. This is treatment. For the first few here, this, the numbers represent the number of days it takes to recover. So for the, in the study that did with the echinacea studies, they had a control which took the placebo and they all took nine days to recover from the colds or the flu. Those taking echinacea got better in six days. In the case of American ginseng, those who, didn't, who took the placebo, 12 days, 13 days. And treatment, five to six days. Others, Siberian ginseng, and another cold remedy, called, a herb called andrographis. Uh, placebo study, uh, the stu in the study, the placebo patients took nine to ten days to recover, but those receiving the Siberian ginseng and the andrographis recovered in six to seven days. But in the elderberry study, those taking placebo recovered in a little over a week, but those taking the treatment recovered in three to four days. In along the lines of that other graph, if you remember, showed you before, where those who were taking the, uh, the elder, elder treatment recovered within three to four days, almost completely. So there's a, a really a dramatic effect happening here. Another herb, wild indigo, uh, the data, because you're combining data from so many different studies, they, they, the way they went at the study was completely different. There they looked at what happened at day five. How many of them were recovered? How many of them uh, were not? So with wild indigo and the placebo, only 27% were better. But those taken wild indigo after, on day five, more than half were better. But still, his elderberry result really stands out here. But I'll describe what's going on here. This happens to be another study on elder looking at the effects on the immune system. 
and they looked at four different factors that are associated with elevated or stimulated immune system. And sure enough, when you don't, when you, in the placebos, nothing happens. You get no stimulation of these immune factors. And various different formulations of Sambuco, one for kids, which is a little bit weaker here. This is the kids formulation. Here's the strongest formulation. Various different formulations were used, but every one of them showed a jump, a boost, in all four of the immune factors tested. So what is that saying? It's saying that the elder is also boosting the immune system. So when you put that together, attacking the virus, attacking bacteria, giving you sustained support after the, after the infection, the initial infection, plus the immune support, this is an incredible medicine. It truly is. Okay, the question was that if, you, if these uh, products uh, are generally not available, then how do we, us, uh, get, the, get take, take advantage of this? Well, in fact, they are available. Um, they, uh, some of them are, uh, I, I'm not quite sure, I, I didn't get enough time to sort this out. I think Sambuco, one of those two, is, uh, is, uh, is some sort of rights distribution issue in Canada. It's available in the United States. Uh, but uh, the other one and other similar products are available. But in fact, you don't need these. The only thing that you really need is the syrup, even elderberry wine, even elderberry vinegar, all of them will give you this benefit. Not that they've been tested in the same way, but they have the same thing. These, this stuff is stable, and there's no reason why it wouldn't have been extracted by that. These are just aqueous extracts, water extracts. Huh? Sorry? Question? Um, I actually found a friend who makes elderberry jam from stevia or honey. That seems to work really well as well. Mm -hmm. So jam is actually another way of doing it. Absolutely. You find someone who doesn't add a load of sugar to it. <laughs> Absolutely, yes, definitely. Any, any, anything. Oh, and to, to come back, I wanted to make a point. Here. You asked what part of the plant. It's the berries in, in all of these studies. That's not to say that these substances aren't present elsewhere in the plant, but the berries seem to be the most productive, the most likely to be commercially produced. Mm -hmm. it, would it just act as a general uh, immune booster to maybe even help prevent That's the way it's looking to me. That's how I would interpret the result. Whether that's true or not, or whether there is a downside to continuous use, that I don't know. I can't answer that question at this point. <laughs> question in the back? Uh, uh, okay, so, sorry, go ahead. Have you come across any studies about uh, people who have um, overactive immune uh, no, I did not. No, sorry, that's a good question. That's always the concern when you're taking so-called immune boosting herbs. Are they making things worse? Those who have, you know, overly sensitive, have allergies, etc. But interestingly, uh, I was well talking in a few minutes. Uh, elder flowers is one of the prime remedies for professional herbalists today for the treatment of allergies. Question. Oh, for sure. Uh, in principle, yes, it's true that the different solvents, vinegar, water, alcohol, etc., will extract different substances. In principle, that is absolutely true. Whether the active constituents that give you this effect are differentially uh, extracted by vinegar, water, alcohol, I can't answer that question. I don't know. It's my impression that these things are all water extracts. Okay.
Okay, so, all right, so what can you do? What are some of the things you can do at home? Oh, we got a question back here. Sorry, have I been ignoring you? <laughs> Is, is the bark medicinally active? Yes, it is medicinally active. Um, at the beginning, I showed a slide of the, 16th, uh, the 17th century doctor, German doctor, and he, he, set, he set out uh, in, in the whole series of chapters in his book. And one of his chapters is devoted to the bark, the stem, and other parts like that. So there are. But in modern medicinal practice, it's all berries and flowers. Okay. Okay. So, what are some of the things that you can do at home? Very simple things you can do for medicinal use. Elderberry syrup. Here's a recipe right here, but it's very simple. I mean, you, you probably most of you already intuitively know how to do this sort of thing anyway, uh, from based on other fruits. So, just fresh berries or even dried berries, water and sugar, a little bit of lemon. And that preparation method, and you can make a syrup. You can take a cup. If you're, if you're feeling the effects of a flu, four times a day, a teaspoon, a tablespoon. It really doesn't matter. Huh? Elderflower tincture. I mentioned that the flowers in particular are effective against allergies. So modern herbalists today, if they have a problem with the oversensitive individuals suffering from allergies, they will try elderflower in its various forms. It can be a tincture or it can be a tea. So how do you make the tincture? Well, here are the, the recipes. Very simple. One part water to three parts vodka. All you do is take either the fresh elderflowers or dried, put it in a wide mouth jar, Maybe mash it up a little bit, get it down, and then put that mixture to, uh, to the level that it covers all the, the, the material and let it sit for at least a month in a, in a dark area. Every day, taking it and shaking it, shaking it vigorously for a little bit, maybe for a minute or so, uh, for that first 30 days. And that tincture will last up to 10 years. This is something handy to have in your home. Uh, something that I've learned from previous experience in making tinctures, uh, if you don't have vodka, rum, or other types of liquors like that that are relatively strong alcohol content, or if you don't like the flavor of it, you can always use those, or a coolie that apparently you can get from Quebec. That works too. Oh, sorry, which, what was that? The last one? Uh, some sort. I have no idea what it is. So I've never oh, used it. Okay. Okay. So yes, you, the key here is that uh, the assumption in this re recipe here is that the, that the alcohol is 40% alcohol. The key is to have the right water alcohol com combination to give you the best extract. So as long as you adhere to that, if you're dealing with 40% alcohol, then you can substitute for the vodka according to taste just as you suggest, so thank you for that. Okay, so that's elderflower tincture, and again, the same idea that at the moment you feel the effects of flu coming on, start taking it. If you, uh, for those of you who are really excited about elder now, you definitely want to get this book. This book has, this book has a lot of uh, what I talked about here, not, not the scientific stuff, uh, but uh, there are the recipes I've indicated here are from this book. And uh, also it has some really nice anecdotes. People who have actually used it and a relating experience, especially uh, the experiences of the First Nations people. Uh, so it's a really interesting collection of accounts by the International Herb Association. Those are the sponsors of the Herb of the Year program. So we have that book available for sale. And finally, elderflower tea. Elderflower tea, how simple does that get? You just dry your elderflowers. Don't even, if you're having trouble getting berries and birds are taking them, go after the flowers. Birds will leave the flowers alone. The flowers are really effective. 
good, as I said, for, for allergies, but also for the cold and flu season. So with that, I'm going to end. And uh, I'll take more questions after Cordy, because Cordy's going to tell you a little bit about some of the other uses of uh, uh, elder. At Richter's, it's not just a garden, it's a whole new world. For herb plants, seeds, veggies, and more, visit us at richters.com or call 1-800-668-4372.